My talk will be first music, second speech. I have a third part, which is speech and music, but I don't have time to present it today. And it's mostly about hemispheric asymmetries, what are processed by the two hemispheres, where speech and music is processed in the same places, and when uh, you see differences. Um, but I will not touch upon that. We can discuss that later if you're interested. OK. Um, up. <clears throat> so the first question about music that interests me, you have many things uh, interesting with music, like the pleasure, um, you know, like the complexity of the timbre of the different acoustic features that are represented in sounds. But what I, I'm interested in is more this. So I don't understand this because I don't dance. And, you know, evolutionary speaking, for me, it makes no sense, you know, uh, why why people do that. But everyone is doing this, okay? And when you think about dancing, it's specific to audition, okay? It's specific to music, and it's specific to only certain types of music. So it's quite very selective in multiple ways. But still, every culture in the world is dancing. So the question for me is, wh why when you perceive some sounds, you naturally activate your motor system in a very explicit way, okay? So the question, I think, is when does the motor system participate to auditory perception? In parallel, and it's, this is a figure for David. If you hear me, David, this one is for you. Paul Bain, the younger, you know, your friend and a neighbor. Uh, when you watch paintings, you don't dance, okay? So the second question is, why is it specific to auditory modality? I think we'll never be able to fully answer this question, but we can find some specificities in the audio-motor coupling that are not present with, for example, the visual system. I will not discuss this today, but we, we have some work on this. Um, okay, so I will start with two small introductory concepts. First, if you look at movements, I told you they are structured in time and people naturally move at around 1.52 hertz. Okay, when you walk, it's very rhythmic, it's very periodic even. And if you ask people to spontaneously tap, if I ask you to clap your hands, all of you will naturally clap at around 2 hertz. Okay, it's a range, there's some variability, but no one is doing. Okay, you can't keep up for one minute. And no one is tapping very slowly. Actually, when dreamers, they move slowly, what they do is they count in their head. They do one, two, three, four, one, two, three. So they trick the stuff, you know. So naturally, we are naturally inclined to move at this frequency. And, you know, this, uh, when you, people produce music, before computers, we are producing music with our movements. So naturally, the beat of music is also around 2 hertz, 120 BPM. Uh, this kind of slides, I will show it a lot for those who are not familiar with auditory processing. So this is a sound. Okay, this is time, this is a sentence, this is time and frequency from low to high pitch. You can also represent the sound just as sound pressure. You know, that's the volume or the amplitude of the signal. And you have time. And here you just extract what we call the envelope. Okay, that's the contour of the uh, uh, sound pressure. And this envelope, it gives you the dynamics of the sound, okay? And if you do a um, uh, Fourier transform of it, you compute the uh, modulation spectrum, what we call it. So it's not the spectrum of the signal itself with frequencies from 0 to 20 kilohertz. It's the spectrum of the envelope. And usually it's low frequencies between 0 and 50 hertz, basically. And you see that for speech, when we speak, you have some regularities in the signal, and the peak is at around 5 hertz, okay? And for music, if I go back here, the regularity is at around 2 hertz, okay? So all the music, some are fast, some are slow, but when you play a fast music, it's 150 BPM, it means 2.5 hertz. And when you play a very slow music, because you're a beginner at the piano, you play at 60, which means 1 hertz, okay? So we are between 1 and 3. And music, it's faster. We speak between 5 and 8 hertz, but you never go at 16 hertz the beat, okay? Because you don't perceive individual notes anymore, nearly. Okay. Um, what's interesting with this movement that I presented is that if you look at brain activity during resting state, you also see delta activity. That's for you, Natalie. Um, 
So this is a, a study by Anne Keitel. She was recording participants doing nothing in the image scanner, okay, resting state. Source reconstructing the signal, extracting a region of interest here, for example, the left motor cortex, and then doing a sort of spectral analysis of the dynamics to see what are the, where is the energy represented. You see a lot of beta activity, you know, the beta bursts that are well known in the motor system, but you see also a lot of delta activity. Of course, you have the one over F decrease of activity, the aperiodic, but on top of it, you see a bump, and it's actually quite big if you analyze it. If you look at monkey data, you see it more clearly here, okay? Um, so what's interesting is that even during resting state, you have natural dynamics in the delta band in the motor cortex. And people that study movements, you know, they use a lot of this representation. So you record multi-unit activity and you do a PCA and you extract like the manifold and you uh, explore how these uh, trajectories encode in specific movements. And usually people, they have this trajectory and they see like beta burst appearing at different moments of the trajectory. And these bursts are encoding like the specific movement. But what's interesting is that this trajectory occurs at a scale of two hertz. Okay. One cycle is 500 milliseconds and it's circling, circling, circling. Okay. And this is true for rhythmic movements, but this is even true for non-periodic movements or articulatory movements in humans for the different articulators of the mouth. Okay. So these delta dynamics that are not a lot studied in the motor system, because they are like the carrier frequency of the uh, population activity, in fact, they are um, uh, robustly uh, represented in the motor cortex activity. Okay? So, very simple. I want to say that just there's a range of dynamics in the motor cortex in the delta band, not only the beta band. The second thing is what, why I'm interested in the motor system. Um, the ID, one of the, the big theories of uh, time processing is that time is processed by the motor system. So, um, you know, how do we represent time? We don't have any organ dedicated to time processing. And some people say that any group of neurons that are coupled can process time. And some say that it's more a centralized function uh, by the uh, motor system. Like, And so the question is, you know, for example, David Robb, a colleague of mine in Marseille, says we don't perceive time. You know, we can't perceive time, so we estimate time indirectly. So, for example, you can estimate time by uh, deriving space. If you see an animal that is approaching you and he was very far away, you can estimate the duration that it took him to arrive by deriving the, the, um, the special uh, trajectories that he has made. Or you can derive time by moving. If you move at two hertz and I say, oh, I had time to move four times between this um, segment, probably it's two seconds because each time I move, it's 500 milliseconds. So this is the idea that you recycle uh, motor routines that are very uh, nicely tuned to you know, coordinate movements. And based on this recycling, you can estimate the durations, but you don't estimate them naturally. It's just a um, derivative. So you have a lot of papers on this. And the idea is that the motor system is in particular involved in timing and time perception in the range of seconds. Uh, a cool fact is that if you put someone in a scanner and you ask the person to move, you see the motor systems, okay? SMA, bilateral motor cortex, basal ganglia, cerebellum. But if you present musical rhythms to participants, okay, they are not moving, passively laying in the scanner. And you see, of course, a lot of activity of the auditory cortex that we don't see here, but you see also activity in the motor system without any movement, okay? So you have a natural activation of these regions, uh, by listening to complex musical rhythms. And uh, when we were postdoctoral fellows in New, in New York, Luc Arnel and, and me, we made a bunch of papers with, Luc was with David Popple uh, about the uh, role of delta and beta oscillations in the motor cortex uh, for the encoding of temporal predictions or predictive timing. If you perceive sounds, you have a lot of temporal regularities and you can anticipate the next sound to optimize its processing. And we found that uh, specifically delta and beta oscillations, the motor cortex were involved in the encoding of this information. And that the motor cortex activity was modulating the activity in the auditory cortex to, and the idea was that it's to optimize auditory processing. Okay. So if you have a modulatory impact of the motor cortex on auditory processing when you can anticipate in time. Okay. So that's the second concept that I wanted to introduce that the motor system, it's moving at two hertz and it's encoding uh, 
temporal predictions. So with this, I will present the first study that um, Arno Zalta, when he was a PhD student in my team, did. Uh, we wanted to see if dancing could be explained uh, by this kind of these two concepts that I presented. Do you dance because uh, the motor system does a predictive timing activity, uh, and that's why you engage your motor system? Uh, um, Arno is now a postdoc in Paris with Valentin Villard. So what we did for that, um, we created lab musics. So it's like boring uh, melodies, but that are very um, um, defined. So here you have a very bo boring melody. So what you see is that you have a, a, a rhythm that is, that's a drum, that's a ch ch. It's at two hertz, okay, 120 BPM. It's always the same across all conditions. We have 36 melodies in total. And here you see that the bass is doing a very boring melody with one note, and it's also always at the same time as the, the drum, okay? So you have a very strict two hertz periodic uh, signal. Then you can make a melody that is a bit more uh, complex. So here, sorry. So here you see always the same drum, and then the bass, sometimes there's a drum without the bass note, and sometimes there's a bass note without the drum. And that's why we call a syncope, a syncopation. Okay? It's when you have to ta, and then you want, you want to move, you know. And then we have high syncopated melodies. So these ones, the drum and the bass never agree on. They are never on sync. Okay? All the drum notes are when there's no uh, bass and vice versa. So you can derive from these melodies, you can estimate with musicology uh, simp very simple equations, uh, the degree of syncopation of each melody. So we had 36 melodies ranging from zero to 15 uh, degree of syncopation, whatever the, the, the unit here. Um, what I want to say is that if you take the uh, modulation spectrum of these melodies, of course, there's a big beat at two hertz or there's a lot of energy at two hertz in the sound itself and just extracting the amplitude at two hertz is a very good proxy of the degree of syncopation okay so acoustically you already perceive the degree of syncopation just by estimating how strong is the beat in the signal okay so that's not very difficult for the brain to derive this value okay then we ask participants to listen to these boring melodies and we say, okay, let's, let's make as if you were dancing to the melody. You tap on the trackpad with your hands and you see that people tend to tap at two hertz. Okay. It's well known, but we replicate that on our, on our study. You move at the beat. Okay. Whatever the degree of syncopation, you principally move at the beat or at the subharmonic. So boring, uh, control. But then more interesting study is how much do you want to dance when you listen to these melodies? So people don't want to dance these melodies because they are super uh, boring. But if you had only that in life, which one would be the one you dance more to? And so what, what's your hypothesis? Do you dance to music that have a very strong uh, beat with no syncopation? Because you can predict in time when sounds will arrive, you can predict perfectly. Or is it the opposite? You dance more to music that are very complex because you don't predict in time, they are too complex, and then you have to make a lot of computations in your brain to be able to, to understand what's happening. So who's voting for A? Okay, who's voting for B? Okay, so actually it's third option. Sorry, I was uh, cheating here. Um, what we observe is that there's a um, um, non-linear relationship between the degree of syncopation and groove ratings. So of course, if it's very periodic, like military march, no one dance. Okay. But it, if it's very complex, like free jazz, no one dance. Okay. So you dance to funkadelic. So it's, it's syncopated, but mildly. Okay. So it's still, you can still understand what's happening. And in free jazz, I, I maybe not a professional jazz man, but no one understands what's happening. <laughs> so, uh, it's like quite a replicated, you know, it was shown first, uh, 10 years ago. And then, so the question, we have a cool phenomenon because we have like a nonlinear relationship between like a, 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 a variable that is not acoustic, but close to the acoustic signal and a subjective thing that relates to your motor system involvement. And you have two classes of model to explain this result. So 
Uh, the first one is uh, Bayesian inference. So we speak about predictions and so on. So it's, it's um, uh, Peter Wust, who is in Denmark in the center of uh, music in the brain, uh, is working on this a lot. So you use the predictive coding framework of Carl Friston, you know, with this like uh, prediction error um, um, cells and this uh, prediction cells. And the model is quite simple, is that the more you have a syncopated melody, the more you have prediction error because it's more complex. But he says, yeah, but you have to multiply that by the precision of the prediction. Okay, because Carl Friston, he likes this idea of the precision, which is about your attentional filter. What is, how well do you estimate uh, in terms of neural population or variance, uh, the, the prediction? And then if you multiply this by this, you obtain this nice inverse U shape. So the advantage of such model is that it's directly relating uh, the fact of dancing to uh, temporal predictions. Okay. The, me, I see two big uh, drawbacks in this model. The first one is that I have two variables and they are perfectly anti-correlated. So how can I look in the brain? <laughs> the respective correlates. Okay. I can't, you know, I need orthogonalized uh, data to be able to investigate where they are encoded in the brain. The second one is that this model is not resolved in time and temporal predictions and music is everything about time. So we moved on to um, work on the second class of models, uh, which are uh, dynamical system models. Okay, and it's uh, um, Edward Large is very involved, uh, very active in this community. You know, he, he was a student of uh, Scott Kelso, and so they developed this kind of uh, coupled oscillator models that are a lot used to explain resting state activity and you know the brain as a dynamical system. So you have a bunch of uh, oscillators that are um, whose natural frequencies are different from one hertz to whatever, and they are uh, connected with one another with specific properties. And then you put some layers, uh, you put layers of coupled oscillators, a bit like a deep net, except that it's not encoding information. There's no computations in this kind of models. Uh, it's, it's just about time and time coordination. Okay. And the computation is an emergent properties of these synchronizations but it's not an explicit uh, metric. So here we created this architecture, which was the simplest architecture that we could do to reproduce our result. What we have is the first layer is capturing the sound. So the first layer activity at two hertz correlates nicely with the degree of syncopation. So, you know, because it's reflected actually the two hertz acoustic activity. The second layer does not correlate with anything, but the third layer correlates a lot with groove ratings. Okay. And so, how do we obtain that, this nonlinear transformation? We need the third layer to reflect the difference between the second and the first layer. It's an activation uh, unit and here it's an uh, inhibition. And so the idea is that by computing the difference between the input and the internal representation, which is in our opinion then the prediction, you have this uh, prediction error weighted thing, which is the groove rating. Okay. So there's more work to do on this, but the advantage of such model is that you can directly um, record them as if you are recording neurophysiology. You know, they are time results and they have dynamics and then you can do the same analysis that you do on brain signals. And then you can also estimate what was the connection, it was a hop bifurcation, what were the parameters and so on. So you can dig into that more. Okay. Um, then we said, okay, it's nice, it's a model, it's simple. Um, let's look at real brain data, which are much more messy. So we asked um, participants to lay in the MEG scanner while passively listening to these melodies for 16 seconds. So it's very long trials, okay? So you don't have only evoked responses at the onset or so on. You have like uh, ongoing activity. And then we, in a first set of analysis, we did source reconstruction of the data. And for each source, we have the time course of activity and we compute uh, power spectrum. And then we did um, um, a trick to remove the one over F, a, a bit a la Thomas Denog. So we did not use this toolbox, but the idea was to, you know, because when you have a power spectrum, you have always more energy in the low frequencies than the high ones, because you have this aperiodic uh, profile of energy. So we wanted to remove it to, to know for each voxel what is the dominant frequency. Okay. So here, the dominant frequency is like 13 Hertz. So you take the max, and you report the frequency at which you find the max power. And when we did that on the MEG data, we observed this. Our hypothesis is that because you listen to a 
music whose beat is at two hertz, you will see two hertz activity everywhere. And in fact, that's not what we observed. Okay, in the auditory cortex, we observe mostly uh, two hertz activity, but then if you look at other dominant frequencies, you see that you're going from the auditory cortex through the dorsal auditory pathway up to the motor cortex in the beta band and up to the inferior frontal cortex in the low gamma band. Okay, so it seems that you have like a spectral gradient of activity going from the auditory cortex to the frontal cortex through the dorsal auditory pathway bilaterally. Okay, we are very surprised by that. And actually, if you dig into the literature, you have like a few papers discussing this idea of a spectral gradient. One of the recent papers is by the team of Joachim Gross, looking at resting state data. You have more alpha activity in the visual cortex, and then you have a gradient going up to theta activity in the frontal cortex. And you have you have this idea that it might be an organizational principle of activity in, in the sensory pathways. Okay. So uh, we said, okay, that's cool. Uh, is it doing something? So first we said we we fitted this data um, on the space. So you know you have the uh, x y z coordinates of the brain, and with a um, uh, fifth order fit, we are able to nicely fit the data. And we said, can we? have the same result if we look at resting state data, you know, when participants are not listening to music, but they are not doing anything. And here you see that you don't fit similarly the data. Okay. So it means that this gradient of activity is present during music listening, but not during rest. And we can quantify that by estimating the quality of fit for each dimension of the space. So X is uh, left to right. So X is not at all capturing the gradient because it means that the gradient is not going from the left hemisphere to the right hemisphere. Okay, There's no uh, trajectory going through the brain, but the y and z axis are very nicely capturing this gradient with a score of 0.5, which is like huge. Um, and during rest, you see that the fit is much worse. Okay, So that's cool. We say we have something that seems a bit specific at least. It's specific to at least sound processing. And then we said, but does it encode or reflex uh, or variable of interest? And we looked, you know, we have conditions with low syncopated melody, mediums, and high. And you see that there are no differences between these conditions. So this gradient does not seem to be different if the melody is syncopated or not. Okay. So it's not reflecting uh, groove. You know, it's not present only when it grooves or it's not present only when it's very rhythmic. It's pr present when there's music. So. Uh, we want to work further on this to investigate what it does and doesn't do. But we went a bit more uh, directly to investigate our variables of interest. So we said, okay, we have two variables, like an objective variable, which is a degree of syncopation, and then this nonlinear transformation that creates groove ratings, which is a subjective output of the participant. Are they encoded in the brain? So uh, we did a decoding analysis. For each frequency, we took the power spectrum, of the channels and for so average over time and for each frequency of the power spectrum we tried to predict either the degree of syncopation or the groove ratings and the coding precision is the output of your uh, mvpa uh, classifier in a way so you see that at two hertz you encode groove and syncopation and you see that you encode much better degree of syncopation and that's actually the only frequency at which you selectively encode degree of syncopation. Okay, Groove is instead uh, selectively encoded in the beta band, significantly more than syncopation, and at 1.4 hertz. Okay, So uh, the beta band has been implicated in motor functions and in predictive timing a lot, so it's not very surprising. But why do you have something at 1.4 hertz? You know, these two frequencies are not related to the sound. The sound, the beat is at 2 hertz. There's no dynamics in the sound at 1.4 or beta band. So they reflect more the intrinsic dynamics of the brain. And um, we recently did a behavioral study uh, wh where we presented um, um, melodies to participants that were either slow or fast. Okay. And we were asking participants, you, you present a melody, you put some noise so that the task is difficult. And at the end, you say, was the last tone of the melody on the beat or not? Okay. And you just vary the speed of the melody. And so at first, the melody is super fast, it's difficult. You reduce the speed, it's becoming easier and easier, but then it's not continuing to be easier. You know, If the melody is too slow, you're very bad at it. And then you have a sweet spot 
at which you're good to pay attention in time. Okay. And so just behaviorally, we observe that the, the rate at which you're good at paying attention to uh, melodies is 1.4 hertz. And in this independent study, we find that you have naturally a 1.4 hertz activity in the brain. Uh, that is encoded groove ratings. Okay, so that's not a direct link, but we, we want to study that further. But, and then we said, okay, this 1.4 hertz activity, where is it located in the brain? So we go, went at the source level and looked at where groove is encoded at 1.4 hertz, and we observed nicely the dorsal auditory pathway, you know, auditory cortex in the left and the right, motor cortex in the left and the right, and a, a more lateralized um, decoding. Beta was more uh, prefrontal, you know, premotor and SMA. Okay. Um, okay. And these two frequencies were coupled in uh, in uh, this hub region. Okay. So with this first study, what we showed is that during music listening, uh, you have like this spectral gradient that is organizing the activity in the dorsal auditory pathway. Uh, we don't know if it's specific to music or if it's also present during uh, speech or whatever processing. Um, we saw that groove. Uh, is reflected in the uh, activity at 1.4 hertz and in the beta rate. Um, and finally, we we show that the fact of dancing is indeed related to predictive timing. You dance when uh, predictions are uh, not too simple and not too hard, when you can understand a bit what is the, the rhythm, but also you dance only if the music is at around 2 hertz, okay? Because that's the range at which you, you process these dynamics. Okay, so future direction, I, I mentioned that already. Um, and that's it for the first part of this talk. Okay, so now I will try to explain to you uh, speech. So we try to play the same game, but speech is much more different, much different. I would not say more complex, because music is very complex too. Um, but we try to look at brain dynamics and see how uh, they are constraining the processing of speech. So, you know, wh what's interesting is speech is that everyone is an expert of speech processing here, probably. Uh, if you speak with someone, you know, you, you, you have your colleague that is explaining that during the weekend she went to Porquerolles, which is a very amazing island close to Marseille. No cars beautiful sea, beautiful fishes, you should go there. And there's this Fondation Carmeniac. And then she said that, oh, my husband, David, examined five beautiful paintings. So if you're from Marseille, automatically you will, you will have in mind this amazing place. But because you're not from Marseille, you probably have in mind uh, David, at least David, not the paintings. But Okay. So there's something weird. You, you perceive some, some noisy sounds because you have also the coffee machine, your other, other colleagues speaking. And then it generates like, uh, okay. We, we had some, uh, um, language uh, discussions yesterday. So with Jeremy, we said, okay, uh, what's happening in the brain so that you're able to go from step one acoustic to step, uh, semantic representation. And so the, the literature is amazingly, uh, rich on this. So you have, for example, this Giro and Purple uh, model that says, yeah, you know, you must process the acoustic signal in at least two time scales that reflect the syllables and the phonemes, and you must process them in parallel thanks to coupled oscillators in the auditory cortex. And it will allow you to pass the, the continuous acoustic signal and to extract some uh, prelexical representations, roughly. But then you can also go at the lexical level and, you know, process words. And you have a lot of interesting properties in the, uh, at the word level. For example, you have this zip low, which is how uh, frequent are words. For example, in English, the is the most frequent word. We use it like 1000 times per day. And the word camembert is like there, except, especially if you're in the US, there's no camembert. So. And there's this zip flow, which means that you have a, a linear de decreasing word frequency uh, when uh, when you sort your wor your words according to their frequency. You know, so it means that you have some very structured organizational principle of uh, how we use words and the frequency at which we use words. And at the post lexical level, we have now a game with uh, uh, you know GPT, ChatGPT, etc. 
In French, we use Camembert, that's the French version of GPT-2. And the game of Transformers is that they actually g give you a sentence and they say, predict the last word based on the previous part of the sentence. Okay, so that's based on the context. Can you predict what is the next word? So it's a game of prediction and it's a, so it's not exactly at the level of words. It's like tokens, but tokens are nearly words. Um, and so these transformers, they, they clearly do, uh, say that based on the context, you can have a good guess of what will happen next and it should facilitate your processing. Okay. So then you, you, if you want to predict speech comprehension, what what is your theory? Is it an acoustic theory? Is it a pre-lexical theory? Is it a theory derived from uh, uh, transformers? It's a big mess. There are so many processes. Uh, you know, it's a big hierarchy of processes that are probably interacting. So, how do you know which ones are important and which ones are not important? So, with uh, Jeremy, we said, okay, let's try to develop a framework that allows us to investigate everything at the same time. So, we used information theory. Okay, because it's a, a um, agnostic metric, you can measure everything with information, you know. And we said, yeah, but speech is online. You know, I speak since like 30 minutes, I speak, I speak, I speak. You don't have time to rest and process the information. You must process it online. So what is important is for us the information rate. That's crucial. And if I start to give too much information, you will explode because you don't have the resources. So... How do we investigate that? So we took sentences and for each sentences we can derive, here we derive seven linguistic features, but you can derive more. The first one is what is the speech rate in terms of the uh, number of increase of energy per unit of time. You can count the number of phonemes, the number of syllables, but your, some syllables are more important than others. So you can compute the syllabic information rate, you know, because for example, if you say, uh, die or dying. Me, I don't speak well English. I always forgot to put the ying at the end of words. It's not a problem. You know, you understand perfectly well what I say. You know, the ying part is like useless syllable. Um, so you can estimate the, what we call static lexical surprise is the word frequency. If words are, um, common or rare. And if they are very rare, it's very surprising. So you can compute that in terms of information theory. And you can have a sentence full of, surprising words you know if someone speaks like shakespeare you're super surprised you know and the contextual lexical surprise is more ba based on the beginning of the sentence was the last word surprising or not you know um so here is not very surprising when you have she taxi you mostly often have driver so you derive a lot of um information rates and the problem is that you know in natural speech phonemic rate and syllabic rate for example are very correlated Okay, if I speak faster, I will produce more syllables, but more phonemes and more acoustic modulations per second. So we took a database to orthogonalize these features because otherwise we can't study them. If they are correlated, then you can do your statistical analysis. But so we, we orthogonalize them by selecting sentences that maximize the non-correlation between our features. And then we asked participants to listen to them and we wanted to do a speech comprehension task. So what we did is that we, we, there's this gating paradigm in vision. We adapted it to, to speech. So the gating paradigm is that you start with something very difficult. You present something compressed time five. So the amount of information that you present per second is huge because all the sentence is super compressed in time. So basically people don't understand speech when it's compressed at time, five time. And then you decrease progressively the compression rate. And then you start to capture some words. And then at some point you understand everything and you have your comprehension point, which is the rate at which you understood the sentence. And then it's becoming trivial, you know. You know that at times two, if you watch YouTube, you always put in a speed it mode, you know. So you can understand very well at times two, but at times five, you you at you you don't understand anything. So you have this um variation of performance with compression rate, but what is cool is that. Each compression rate is associated with a different information rate for different features. And so you can enter the, the, the linguistic features in the LMM and try to predict the performances. With these seven linguistic features, we're able to predict more than 50% of the variance, okay, which is quite huge in my opinion. And for single words, we predict like 85% of the variance. So they are quite relevant. And then we can see 
how each of them influence comprehension. So you see that all the features impair comprehension. So there's no feature if you give more, if you give more information per second, it's simpler. Okay, more information means more energy uh, to process it, and it means it's more uh, difficult. And if you can, if you saturate the system, you 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 have less comprehension. And then what you see is that all of them are significantly uh, impacting comprehension. So they are all uh, it, useful in a way. So it means that what we took from the literature was relevant. You know, we didn't took a feature that is not important. But you see, what is very uh, interesting for me is the, the, the feature that has the strongest impact on comprehension is a syllabic rate. Okay, so that's for David because he loves syllables. Um, so you know, some people say that syllable is useless. Okay, for processing language, this is the the syllabic rate, not the syllabic information rate. The syllabic rate, the number of syllables per second, is the strongest determinant of comprehension. And then. The two that are the most important are this lexical and uh, contextual lexical information. So it means that if you have a sentence that you can predict well what will be said, even if it's said super fast, you will understand it because you, you predict, so you guess. Okay. Okay. Um, so last thing that we did with this paper is that what we wanted to do is to estimate the channel capacity of each of these features. So if you go at the comprehension point when people understand, you can look at what are the values of uh, in terms of information right for each of our features. And we do that for each trial. And then we derive a distribution that reflects the maximum rate at which error-free information was transmitted. And because our features are not correlating among one another, you can do that. Otherwise, you can't do that because you, you would have to. So channel capacity, it's like a measure of information uh, transmission is how much can you put information per second before the stuff uh, breaks down? Okay. So what do we observe? For example, if you look at uh, the syllabic rate, so uh, look at sentences. This is this. The channel. So you have a dist So for each trial, you have like the syllabic rate at which comprehension was uh, done, and so you have this distribution that is centered around 15 hertz. Okay. So basically, below 10 hertz. You never have any challenge, then it becomes challenging and 15 hertz is like seems to be your, your maximum before you will start to, to lose comprehension. For phonemes, you, you have something around 40 hertz, etc. Some are more difficult to interpret. You know, you have a surprise rate of six. Okay. You need to compare that with literature or maybe brain data to start to see if it's relevant or so. But we like the idea of, you know, you, you have an informa fixed information speed bottleneck, so you must not saturate your system so that otherwise you will not be able to understand the sentence and give the information to the next level of processing. So for now, it's just a behavioral study, but the idea is now to look, to go into brain data to see what are the neural correlates of these features. And most importantly, we currently present them as independent processes, each with its own channel capacity, but of course they are uh, not dependent. They are dependent, they are not independent, you know. So we need to also investigate how they interact between one another and uh, how this this big mess that is speech comprehension uh, occurs um, by the interaction of all these, pro these processes. Okay. Um, so we, we're not doing that yet because it's a bit complex and Jeremy had not uh, three more years to finish his PhD. So we said, okay, let's, let's start simple and let's focus on the first steps, which is the syllabic rate and the phonemic rate, because we have seen that the syllabic rate has a huge impact on comprehension. And, um, we wanted to study uh, brain data to better understand what, how the uh, brain activities, you know, the uh, brain activity in the auditory cortex is um involved in the processing of syllables and phonemes okay so i will give you a little bit of background there for those who are not, who are not familiar so you have this model of uh, david um and anne Giro, who who says that okay it's not phonemes or syllables you have a parallel processing of phonemes and syllables at the level of the associative auditory cortex and it's done by um you know you can look at neural dynamics and they will help to parse uh, 
the acoustic information and to segment it, you know, because the neural activity reflects the modulation of excitability of your neural population. And so they create cycles. Okay. And they, they allow you to discretize the information that is continuous in the acoustic signal and to say, Oh, this is the first syllable. And then you send it to the next processing stage. Oh, second syllable, blah, blah. And their idea was that you do that at the syllable level, but also at the phoneme level. Okay. So the first paper of uh, David on this was um, presenting sentences and different sentences and brain activity allowed you to predict what was a sentence. Okay, so you take brain activity, either the phase or the power and for different frequencies. And you see that in the theta range, the phase of the theta activity was predictive of what was a sentence. Okay, so uh, it was a finding that started the entire uh, field of study. And the idea was that this theta activity is tracking to segment the incoming speech. Since then, we know why it is theta activity. It's because when you look at the acoustic envelope, the acoustic envelope is at around five hertz. So you have like strong modulations in the sound at five hertz that reset the brain activity. So of course, you find five hertz activity in the brain too. So you could say that it's a linear coupling. You know, here you have the envelope of the sound. Here you have the brain activity and they are correlated. Okay, they are phase correlated, they are uh, phase locked. So you can look at where it is. It's bilaterally in the auditory cortex, more right lateral. But what is more interesting, in my opinion, is that you observe also nonlinear coupling. Okay, the same five hertz activity in the acoustic envelope is correlating, is correlated with low and high gamma amplitude. Okay, so Joachim Ross was did study all the possible frequencies. And he found that the phase of the, acu so the acoustic signal dynamics is driving a burst of gamma activity, of low gamma activity. He found that with MEG. But if, for example, you look at intracranial recordings, so here you take an electron in the auditory cortex, so it's very much auditory processing. You take the acoustic signal. So the acoustic signal, you have a big modulation at 5 hertz, so energy is at 5 hertz. So, and the phase of this uh, acoustic activity at 5 hertz correlates with the amplitude at 40 hertz and at 120. So this is the high frequency activity. It's like the proxy of multi-unit activity that we don't record in human. So it's, you know, like the high gamma. And you have also a low gamma uh, coupled activity. So it means that at some phase of the sound, you have bursts of activity in the low gamma and high gamma range. Okay. So this for me is uh, interesting because in the, in the um, um, series, you process phonemes and phonemes uh, should be processed by neural dynamics at around 40 hertz because that's the channel capacity of phonemes. So the question was, okay, this activity, does it reflect in a way the sampling of phonemes or is it something else? Okay. And the, the theoretical background to say that it's related to phonemic uh, sampling is huge, but there were never real evidence, okay? People say that in the papers, but there's never data, okay? So we, with Jeremy, we said, okay, let's tackle this issue. And so how we did that, we said, let's, you know, when when I told you when I speak fast, I have more syllables per second, but also more phonemes per second. So the two are correlated. So how can I disentangle which one is processed? You know, one neural process, does it, it, does it track syllables or phonemes? So I need to orthogonalize the two. To orthogonalize the two, what you can do, you take sentences, you can speak them slowly, medium or fast. Okay, so here it's like a very slow speech, medium speech and high speech. So that's the syllabic time scale. And then you create sentences that have a low number of phonemes per syllable, like two phonemes per syllable, or 2.5 phonemes per syllable on average, or three phonemes per syllable. And then you have a phonemic rate here, six, 7.5, nine, up to, 27. So of course you can never orthogonalize syllables on phonemic rates because the phonemes are always embedded in the syllables. So you have a hierarchical relation. You cannot have more phonemes than, than syllables. That just doesn't exist. But you can partly orthogonalize them with this trick. So here the syllabic rate goes from three to six to nine and the phonemic rate goes from six phonemes per second to 27. So we use these ranges because they are below the channel capacity of the syllabic and phonemic rate. And so the idea is that 
even if you compress or decompress speech, people will be able to understand these sentences. Okay. And indeed, when we ask participants to repeat these sentences, they are, they have no issue. You know, they are perfectly able to understand all these sentences, even if the speech rate is varying quite a lot. Okay. So we're within the range where the processing is functional. Okay. So then we said, okay, let's look at uh, brain activity. And usually what people do is they take the acoustic envelope because the acoustic envelope is a good proxy of the syllabic rate. So if you take the acoustic envelope, you compute the modulation spectrum. You see for syllables that are slow at three hertz, you have a big peak of energy at three hertz. For syllables that are at six hertz, you have a peak of activity at six hertz and nine hertz, nine hertz. So the, the, the frequency at which you have the maximum energy in the signal, in the acoustic signal, correlates perfectly with the syllabic rate. Okay. And you can see here, here is the phonemic rate, and you don't have any peaks of energy at this phonemic rate, okay? The envelope is not capturing the phonemic rate at all. So some people say that it's because phonemes are um, uh, abstract concepts. They are not represented in the sound itself, okay? So you can't see them in any acoustic feature, okay? So people focus always on the syllabic scale because you can see the number of syllables just by looking at the envelope, okay? So when we look at brain data, we find the same result. Okay. The neural activity, when you have a sentence at three hertz, you have a strong neural activity at three hertz. When the syllables are at six hertz, you have activity at six hertz and nine hertz, etc. So you see that the brain activity correlates very well with the syllabic time scale. So it means that the, the neural uh, dynamics in the auditory cortex are tracking the syllabic rates in a way. Um, but sorry. Um, but this has been shown like 5,000 times. So our question was more, if we look at this phase amplitude coupled activity, you know, so you have frequency for phase, frequency for amplitude, and you see like low gamma and high gamma activity. Are these um, patterns of activity in a way correlated with the syllabic rate or the phonemic rate? So for example, the amount of coupling, you know, if you have a strong coupling or not, so the color map or the frequency, you know, is the uh, frequency of the low gamma activity going from 30 to 50 if the syllabic rate increase or the phonemic rate increase. So we extracted all these possible features and basically it's an example. We, it's not working. Okay. So the, here is the frequency for amplitude. It's not at all correlated with either the syllabic rate or the phonemic rate. Okay. So this, uh, low gamma. So the high gamma activity is not fluctuating at all because it's a stable frequency. Whatever you do, it's always 120 uh, around that. But this low gamma activity that has been set to either parse or sample does not seem to vary according to our experimental conditions. Okay, so that's a bit of a bummer because everyone says that in a way, a bit vaguely and nothing. Okay, so we are a bit disappointed because in tracranial recordings in humans, you know, a lot of time to design the experiment and so on. And then we said, yeah, but people always look at the acoustic envelope because it's, you know, the volume, it's an important feature of sounds. But actually, if you do a bit of acoustic, you have like an infinite number of features. For example, you have the F0 contour, which is like the fluctuations of frequency of my voice. It's reflecting the prosody, you know. So me, I speak as a French person, I speak blah, 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 blah. But if I was more American, I would be more... uh putting emotions in my speech. I can't do that, sorry. Um, and you know, you have, for example, the spectral flux. The spectral flux is, so you have your time frequency representation of sounds. So you have a maximum of energy, for example, at three kilohertz. And then uh, the frequency at which the maximum energy is, is fluctuating in the frequency domain. So for example, if you have a Forman transition, you have a big decrease in the frequency at which the energy is present in the sound, like bew. So that will be captured by the spectral flux. And you have so many spectral centroid, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So we took these features and we just did a simple decoding analysis saying, okay, I take this feature, I compute the power spectrum of each feature, so the modulation spectrum. And I say, based on this modulation spectrum, can you predict how many syllables there are uh, per second in my sentences? And you see that for syllables, it's super simple. You know, what one is means that the decoding is perfect which is rare with uh, human data. So here it's acoustic data, so that's why it's not noisy. And you see that you have at least, you have five features that are above 95% of accuracy. 
Okay, so envelopes that everyone uses, but also these four other features. Okay, so you can really easily predict the number of syllables per second by looking at five acoustic features. And for phonemes, first, what you observe is that it's much more difficult. So it's true that the phonemes are not explicitly represented in the sound, but you see that you have two features, and especially the pink one, spectral flux, that is uh, decoding quite well um, uh, the, the number of phonemes per second, and importantly, it's doing that much better than the envelope. Okay, so in in a speech processing um, in the speech processing domain, everyone is focusing on the envelope, but we said, okay, let's look at the spectral flux. So if you look at it, here it's an envelope signal. Okay, you see the syllables. And the spectral flux has a much faster dynamic. Okay. So if you look at the modulation spectrum of the spectral flux, okay, you see a first peak at three hertz when the sentences have a syllabic rate at three hertz. But you see that you have a second peak in the acoustic uh, feature and that this second peak seems to reflect the phonemic time scale. Okay. And here you see two and here you see two. And if you correlate, so you can extract the first peak. What is the frequency of the first peak, like 3 hertz, 6 hertz, 9 hertz? This first peak correlates very well with the syllabic time scale, more than the phonemic time scale. And the second peak correlates well with the phonemic time scale, like perfectly. You know, the slope is 1, the R square is 0.4. So you can very much derive the phonemic rate uh, based on the uh, second peak of the spectral flux. Okay? So People will say, yeah, but maybe it's because it's French, you know, you speak French, you do this strange stuff. So we looked at like 18 languages and here is a modulation spectrum of the envelope, you know, that is well studied. So you have a main peak at five hertz, like it's very well documented. And for the spectral flux, you see that you have two peaks. Okay. That's not exactly the same frequency for the different languages. So it's like, uh, it's many hours of uh, audio recordings each time. Okay, but you have two peaks in the spectral flux, so it's not specific to French. Okay. okay. So now we said, okay, that's good, but maybe the brain doesn't care about that. Does the brain tracks this uh, dynamic that is present in the spectral flux? Does the brain capture the spectral flux? Maybe it's something that is captured by microphones, but not by the brain. And so we did like the um, uh, stimulus brain phase coherence. Um, and we actually see that, okay, the first peak of the neural response is correlating very well with the syllabic time scale, and the second peak of the neural response is correlating fairly well with the phonemic time scale. R square equals 0.86. We're quite happy about that. So it means that we saw that in the acoustic signal and we saw that in the brain data. And then we said, okay, where is it represented in the brain data? So the first peak, which tracks the syllabic time scale, is represented uh, in the auditory cortex. And the second peak who tracks the phonemic time scale is also represented in the auditory cortex. You have less uh, channels that are significantly um, uh, recording this uh, dynamics. And these two uh, dynamics are co-located. Okay? So here, it's the number of channels that track the syllabic time scale only, numbers that track the phonemic time scale only, and the numbers that track both. Okay? And all the channels that track the phonemic time scale also track the syllabic time scale. So that, that, that seems to be a parallel processing um, in co-localized uh, regions. Okay. So what we we said with this paper that we are still uh, working on it, so please uh, don't hesitate to, to shoot it, um, is that it's nice to look at the envelope. People have looked at the envelope for 15 years. Let's look at the spectral flux because it's much more interesting. Um, and when you look at that, you can see that the brain dynamics are tracking both the syllabic and the phonemic time scale in the auditory cortex. We don't say that they process syllables or phonemes because we have not analyzed the content. You know, we should do decoding or something. Uh, and then the last point for you, David, is that <laughs> this theta gamma phase amplitude coupled activity does not seem to be related to uh, the phonemic time scale. So we don't know what it's doing. And I will hereby uh, make the, the future direction. So first, we focused here on syllables and phonemes. The idea is to look at also uh, contextual information, like more high-level lexical uh, features, how they are encoded in the brain, and so on, and really to see how they are encoded, you know. Um, 
then to see here we saw uh, um, neural uh, activities that tracks the syllabic and phonemic time scales. But now we want to see if it's coding for linguistic content. So we need to uh, estimate uh, syllables, you know, in a way, uh, the, the, the content of the syllabic information. Uh, either how the syllable is predictive or what is the content with uh, like a vector of representation and see if this information is encoded here. And the last point is that, okay, the acoustic signal is driving brain responses at the theta, low gamma and high gamma rate in the brain. And these responses, uh, we don't know very much what they're doing. Uh, what, what, what are they reacting to? Okay. When do you, when do you have more gamma activity? When do you have less gamma activity? And for now, it's not correlating with syllabic or, or phonemic time scales. Okay. So with this, I want to emphasize the work, um, done by Arno for the music project and Jeremy for the speech project is now at Cambridge with Matt Davis. Uh, I want to thank Ed Large for the modeling part and, uh, thank you all for your attention.